Europe was projecting through the soft underbelly. Soldiers of the American 5th Army and the British 8th Army fought slowly up the bloody peninsula of Italy. Town after town was leveled by Nazi dive, dive bombers and artillery. Allied air might and the weary foot soldier continued the, the, the destruction. Today, scarcely a hamlet remains which does not show the scars of war. Leghorn, a fierce, grim battle was fought here. Gallant Nisi of the 100th Battalion spearheaded the drive on this town. Closely behind advancing infantry came American service forces, cleaning up the wreckage and destruction that was led on. Even as Nazi artillery shells continued to fall on the town, engineers and ordnance men were building stockpiles to support the advance north. Army depots covered the battleground. Almost to within the shadow of the leaning tower of Pisa, stockpiles were built to ensure victory to our forces. Miles of surplus supplies stand as a monument to the American soldiers who fought the war and are continuing to fight for peace. This surplus property is being classified, checked, stored, in order to make possible its sale to foreign government, charitable organizations, and American business interests. When the physical inventory has been made, a surplus property declaration is forwarded by the Army Base Section to the Office of the Foreign Liquidation Commissioner. This declaration is now carefully checked for the condition of the merchandise, whether it is new, good, fair, or poor. The standard commodity code number is placed on the declaration for the purpose of determining the percentage of retained value based on the condition of the merchandise. Cranes, trucks, and jeeps are in this declaration. In the office of the Foreign Liquidation Commissioner in Rome, ex-GIs, former businessmen, merchants, salesmen, accountants, are now engaged in the manifold duties greater than those of the largest mail order house. Such an ex-serviceman, formerly a Midwestern businessman, affixes to the declaration the actual cost price to the American taxpayer after the property has been shipped abroad so that appraisal engineers may determine from the condition code the established price for resale. An American Army captain, an engineer by profession, following the condition code established by a United States appraisal engineering firm hired by the Foreign Liquidation Commission, is able to determine from this declaration what should be a fair return to the American taxpayer on the vast expenditures necessary in modern warfare. However, a mere paper appraisal is not sufficient, cannot be considered good business tactics either to the ultimate consumer or to the American taxpayer. Therefore, in cooperation with the Army, actual physical appraisals by trained mechanics, professional men and artisans, cross-check the paper appraisal. Here, generators and magnetos are examined. A Jeep engine is checked and headlights tightened. After the price determination and a further final check, declarations are ready to be entered 
into a catalog listing the manifold items necessary for a modern army. Since the Office of the Foreign Liquidation Commissioner disposes of both army and naval surpluses, the organization represents the combined operation, and naval men as well as army personnel work in conjunction with civilians. The listings are stenciled and bound into a complete catalog for perusal and study by foreign governments, charitable organizations, and American business interests. ARAR, the Italian government agency, for the purchase of surplus property corresponding to the Office of the Foreign Liquidation Commissioner, is one of the first to receive the new catalog. Close cooperation between both organizations enables them to send their men to American army depots in Italy to countercheck the merchandise listed among the declarations and placed in the catalog. The dreadful destruction of war, it seems here. The reconstruction has begun and slowly people return to their villages. Reconstruction is much slower, for one bomb can undo the work of a generation of labor. This catalog is being purchased in bulk by the Italian government. Last month, negotiations are entered into, mostly minor details. On behalf of the United States, Colonel Daniel P. Hawkins, Field Commissioner in the MTO, affixes his signature to the contract, as Mr. Crespi and Mr. Di Benedetti, officials of ARAR, witness the signature. Professor Rossi, Chairman of ARAR, signed on behalf of the Italian government. The contract having been signed, an ad placed in the Italian newspapers announcing public bidding, bids begin to arrive at the office of ARAR. However, it is deemed advisable for the prospective buyers to visit various depots and appraise merchandise in which they are interested. Indeed, it is considered necessary that physical appraisal be undertaken. Only legitimate bids will be recognized, which means that they must always be accompanied by a check which represents 10% of the total bid. The day that the bids are opened, all bidders are invited to attend, so that competitors may know how bidding is conducted, and also who is awarded the contract based on high bids. Thus they see that no fraud is perpetrated. The bids are checked, the highest bid is announced, Congratulations are in order. Reconstruction and rehabilitation must commence with Treasury Minister Corbino signs for Italy an agreement to purchase from the United States all surpluses in the Mediterranean theater to further Italy's program of reconstruction and rehabilitation. Signing to the United States is Paul Bonner, Central European Field Commissioner, OFLC. In an atmosphere of friendship, $565 million of surpluses were turned over to Italy to rebuild the bomb-torn country. On the table before the two men were the symbols of that friendship, the American and Italian flags side by side. Power to run machines, power for electric lights, transportation, and reconstruction. Hydroelectric power, one of the most recent, naturally is high on the list in rehabilitating a country for section. Wheels turn slowly at first. But as the people gradually return to normal pursuits, they turn faster and faster, and destruction slowly gives way to reconstruction. Bridges blown by the enemy as he retreated, or by our air forces as we advance, must be rebuilt. Transportation across the bridges will reach the industry so that raw materials may be carried to the factory and the fish product to the consumer. Under fire, this train put a bridge in place. It is repeating its job in peace. This steel mill was partially knocked out during the war. Its furnaces are burning brightly again, and labor is once more turning to rehabilitation. Steel girders for reconstruction of other industries are coming out of the flames. Valmontone, last enemy stronghold south of Rome, fought over bitterly in a delaying action, is slowly recovering as American surplus property sold to the Italian government is used to rebuild this ancient town. Famed Casino, having felt the full weight of Allied military might, 
is slowly rising above its crumbled wall. This completely fitted dental unit, once in the heat of battle as part of a mobile hospital, is now bringing aid to Casino and its environs. Casino's citizens, homeless and ragged, receive packages of clothing transported from northern Italy in trucks, which during the war carried ammunition and supplies to the troops in the battle line. Here is ammunition for the peace offensive. Allied air power bombed Italy's rail system into oblivion. American railroaders turned soldier rebuilt it. American locomotives, American flat cars are now carrying payloads in Italy. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any 